It's the most wonderful time of the welcome back. Um, this is, of course, the part of the year where we get to look back and make lists as we geeks like to do. Um, and it's always a good chance to reflect on and pick up other recommendations from people and blah, blah, blah. So there'll be three videos in this series. There'll be this one on standalone Blu-rays. There'll be one on box sets, because it isn't really fair to compare, say, something that can encompass someone's whole career versus a standalone 15 quid Blu-ray, I don't think. And then there'll be a separate one on um, albums of the year for, uh, for the music fans on the channel. And we cover everything, so... I was going to do a, a separate one on honourable mentions. That's self-indulgent even for me. So what I'll do is I'll make them, but I'll just fly through them here. Uh, Radiance was released this year of um, uh, Cutter's Way. was fantastic, but it's a straight reissue of Fun City's edition from last year. So I'm not including that, unlike you, Sight and Sound. However, for your John Heard kick... John Micklin Silver's Chilly Scenes of Winter did come out this year. Fantastic film, um, which, yeah, again, directed by a woman, but it shows you this kind of pathetic guy after a relationship, smashes the fourth wall, talks to the camera. If you like High Fidelity, check this out. Again, I'm not going into too much detail on these ones, just being the honourables. Um, a film which has been divisive from a director who's Mostly had great reviews, but if you hate him, you really hate him. It's Ari Astro's new film, Bo's Afraid. Um, not been released in the UK at all. A24 haven't released much over here the last few years, unfortunately. Um, but luckily, uh, this German media book edition is on 4K. Um, stunning film, imaginative, all over the place, sprawling, epic. Is it self-indulgent? Yes, but it's part of the reason why it's great. I think it's in the DNA of the film. Okay, we're not gonna, I wish I had time to go into much more detail on a lot of these, but mm, I waffle on so much anyway. Arrow's 4K of Blood and Black Lace. Absolutely stunning, stunning stuff. I mean, this film, if you aren't going to do this on 4K and do a good job with it, you might as well give up the 4K game. This is a wonderful restoration where Bava's colours just pop out the screen, may as well be 3D. Um, it's unlike the original Arrow Blu-ray and any Blu-ray, it's in the correct aspect ratio for the first time. And yeah, it's just a stunning, stunning edition of one of the great films of, of the movement from Mario Bava of that Italian Gothic period. Oh, it pains me not to have this in my top 10, but the BFI's targets, um, wow, um, finally... Um, after it being pulled from the schedules and rights issues and whatnot, to finally have it and in such a stacked edition, great stuff. It's very much the the meeting of two eras. It's where the old Hollywood meets the new, and there's a turbulent piece of violence to tie them together. Um, so the old Boris Karloff, literally a film inside a film with the terror footage meets the new Peter Bogdanovich. Um, so you, you get this mashup of two different eras in a, in a film that's horribly prescient, um, but a wonderful achievement, and what a debut for Peter Bogdanovich. Um, yeah, stunning, stunning stuff. And yeah, did he die this year or last year, Peter Bogdanovich? Anyway, rest in peace, Pedro. Arrow US's release of Bogart's The Desperate Hours. Um, folks, don't don't watch the Mickey Rourke remake with Anthony Hopkins. Um, this is Bogart at his menacing best. It's Bogart essentially doing a mashup almost of what he did, the, the breakout role of his in the Petrified Forest from 1938, and then a little bit of, of um uh Key Largo uh, with Edward G. Robinson. Um, with him kind of flipping the rules. So it's it's a little bit of a mashup of those. Don't sleep on it, though, just because it's not one of of uh, Bogart's most famous films. It's one of his later films. Um, and it's it's stagey, but in all the right ways. And it's, it's maybe Bogart's best last tough guy performance. Um, so, yeah, Desperate Hours. Great stuff. A wonderful demonstration on 4K of a stunning achievement in cinema. Um, so this is more of a, a pick, uh, an honourable because of the achievement in 4K. It's um, All Quiet in the Western Front in this lovely media book edition. 
Um, it's coming out again on Steelbook if anybody prefers to wait. Um, but there's a reason why this was up for all sorts of awards last year. Um, it's just, I mean, it's all quiet in the Western Front. Do you need, do you need any more recommendation than that? The only thing to say about it that can possibly uh, commend it anymore is it's another version of that classic novel that remakes the classic film, but doesn't feel like it's redundant. So it doesn't just feel like that 1930 uh, Millstone original with better effects and more realistic. No, it feels like a, a vital, alive story over a century since World War I. Um, and yeah, stunning achievement. I'm trying to cut myself short because I'm, I'm going to find myself just going into dark places, did a review in the channel, so I won't go into this at all. But there's a great documentary on here. Uh, what's it called again? Uh, Looking Into Dark Places with Jonathan Rigby. And he explores um, early 1970s horror films. It's an hour long that aren't Hammer and Amicus. So you're going to get some more Tygon and Tyburn and standalones and uh, allied artists and you know, things from, from other studios and um, uh, Freight and, and the likes, um, Hill House, you know, th things that were released by copycats in a way, but some wonderful original films like this, because this is stunning. If you haven't seen my video on it, do so. Uh, not for, for me, for the video, but also for me. Uh, Michelle Wow had a hell of a year last year, but this year she's had um, a few things released again. My favorite being Eureka Master of Cinema's um, Magnificent Warriors, very much uh, a kind of Indiana Jones take on the martial arts genre, which does go into quite a deep war film in places. Um, but essentially, it, it's kind of a difficult job of of straddling two two horses at the same time, one where it's Chinese versus Japanese because it's set during World War II, but also knowing the Japanese market's quite big. So it doesn't want to portray the, the Japanese people uh, in too bad a light. So actually it gives you a more humanistic um, approach to it than a lot of, of Western cinema uh, does, even though it's over-the-top fun at the same time. And it was really her last big action film before she went into retirement, and when she got married, um, the marriage didn't last, so thankfully neither did the retirement. I mean, she came back with a plum in the early 90s. Uh, let's see. Two for here of Scorsese films released this year. After Hours on 4K and Hugo on 4K. From Criterion, from Arrow from the mind of Martin Scorsese. So his 80s classic with Griffin Dunn and John Heard, speaking of uh, Chilly Scenes of Winter, um, which, yeah, I think we all know the story of After Hours. It's one of those, it all happened in one night, madcap adventures, but a great commentary on 1980s society. Hugo gets the edition it always deserves. Absolutely stacked. Um, wonderful limited edition from Arrow um, with just, Tons and to look at all that. It's just the extras in those sections down below. All that stuff there. Um, so all the round tables and all the extras that weren't on the studio desk, we get them here, and then all sorts of new features about Meliers and um yeah. This film itself was I was enjoying it for about an hour and ten, and then the last half hour just pushed it way over the edge to become, yeah. Can someone give us a really deluxe version of Silence now, please? That would be nice. Because we're still in the Honourables, so I'm really going to fly through these last few of the Honourables. They may be giants. One of my favourite films of the 70s, George C. Scott thinks he's Sherlock Holmes. Um, he's in a, a asylum, and Joan Woodward as Dr. Joan Watson um, becomes his sidekick. Very much... Uh, a proto Fisher King by Terry Gilliam. Um, if you like that film, believe me, you'll love this. But yeah, this is one of the great originals of of nineteen seventy cinema. Again, comes from a stage play, and just sh shows that George C. Scott was much closer aligned to that new generation of filmmakers than ever was to to the classic era. Um, again, a couple of films that are done videos on Touch of Evil. From Eureka, Masters of Cinema, peerless Orson Welles stuff. Um, his Hank Quinlan has to be seen to be believed, his direction even more so. Wonderful, 
if it's people argue if this is the last real noir before noir's classic period ends. If it isn't the last noir, then it's at least the last the word on noir. And we'll pair it with the trial. Orson Welles' great, The Trial with Anthony Perkins. Um, we had a European release of this last year from Studio Canal, but this criterion adds another Welles film, Making the Trial. And if you've seen Making Othello, his making ofs are as interesting as most of his films. So this criterion is absolutely recommended. And then the last of the Let's Fly Through Thems, Invaders from Mars, um, which came from, who even was the label now? Uh, Ignite Films, so not a major. Um, and it was a little bit pricey at first, but I think now on Amazon you can get it pretty cheap. Um, yeah, classic of the 1950s um, sci-fi invasion films, which are really telling a, a, an allegory for uh, for them, their reds over there, and that their Russia. Um, yeah, young boy starts to have notions that his parents may not be, you know, it's, it's almost proto body, proto body snatchers. Um, so yeah, brilliant stuff from the 50s. Toby Hooper remade it in the 80s, and to be honest, it didn't change very much. Some updated effects, but this still holds up. This holds up as an original, better than thing from another world versus the thing, for example. This holds up more as an original film. Tops 10 time. Um, I have done a video on this, so I won't go into too much detail. Number 10, Unman, Witching, and Zygo. Um, We mentioned horror films of the 70s that aren't Hammer, that aren't Amicus. This is one of the greatest. Um, it's never been released on home video, ever. VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, and Arrow US finally released it this year. David Hemmings is a teacher who comes to find that his class may have bumped off the last teacher, and if he doesn't do what they say, may have ideas on him too. Stunning treatment, great documentary with uh, Matthew Sweet, wonderful commentary with John Hogan and Kim Newman. Uh, just, yeah, brilliant stuff from the 1970s, great commentary on the, the school system we have in this country and how it, it Gets you designed to pass exams, but not to learn anything. Um, and imagination only really comes from the depraved, which, hmm, that's an idea I can get behind. I'm in Wittering and I go in at 10. At number nine, I think I spoiled it with the thumbnail, but I was a little bit proud of the thumbnail. It's such a technical achievement, and it's the best looking 4K I've ever seen, and the best sounding 4K that I've seen in what's it been six, seven years of 4K that I've had. Um, when did Alien Covenant come out? Because that was the one that came free with the 2017. Yeah, so six going on seven years. It's Oppenheimer. Now, yeah, some people, oh, it's boring. Oh, it's just three hours of people sitting in rooms. If every film like this of three hours of people sitting in rooms, which, by the way, 12 Angry Men is one of the greatest films ever made, folks, um, then give me more films of people just sitting around talking because this was tense, intense, deep, thoughtful. The pace never let up, and I did ne never felt like um, the pace dried or was, was an issue at all. If anything, it just flew in for me. It was such a... A wonderful performance from Kelly and Murphy, who's got to do a very delicate balancing act in terms of you have to go along with Oppenheimer's approaches uh, enough to give him the benefit of the doubt, but also be wary of what the whole scheme is. Some of the criticisms I don't understand. Oh, it doesn't show you the damage to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's kind of the point of the film, folks. It's coming from a scientific point of view. Can we do this? Can this be done? with no real regard for the people in the streets. And it's very telling when, and I don't think it's a spoiler to say the bombs drop, that's when he starts having visions of real people and you see a few Asian people for the, for the first time. So I don't see those as valid crit critiques whatsoever. But again, the, the presentation it is the crispest 4K you've ever seen, the plumes of fire erupting when the, the test is done, which is the scene depicted on this rather lovely steelbook cover. The detail on those plumes, unbelievable. The detail on newsprint, you can zoom right in and read it as clear as day. 
is a wonderful achievement in cinema. Um, although it's only a 5.1, it will absolutely blow away your speakers. I promise you that. I promise you that. In at number eight, oh, excuse me while I sneeze. I remembered to actually hit the pause button to sneeze for a change. In at number eight, the BFI's release of EO um, by uh, Gier if I ever pronounce Polish names, they're the ones that I butcher most of all, Jerzy Skalmowski. Um, so Skalmowski has been around since the mid-1960s, right, to the slew of classics like Deep End and things. Um, but he's still going, he's still making films this stunning, this relevant, this powerful. He owes the story of the titular Donkey, um, in Poland, who set free after a law has changed for uh, circus animals not to be kept um, under that kind of duress. And it's, it's an episodic story, essentially a little take on um, Brisson's Oh Hazard Balthazar, where we follow this donkey into adventures. But it's not about a donkey. It's about the humans that he meets along the way. And who's really the animal here? Who's the dumb animals? When he meets depravity, he meets violence, he meets, um, oh, I don't want to say too much because I think this is a film you should really jump into, but I promise you it'll break your heart. And uh, that's from minute one. You'll just feel, I mean, this donkey is so emotive and it also speaks to how we read into animals. We read emotions into them like some kind of, uh, Rorschach test um, but it's not just a simple film about a donkey's travels either there's some stunning filmmaking with red filters hence the hence the cover um, there's a scene where Eo is, is lost in a woods and it turns into a gothic horror for a few minutes it's like Hansel and Gretel um, there's, he's being pursued by wolves and it's a horror film it's shot and sounds like a horror film, just for a minute or two. So Skalmowski's talent is putting them in these different environments and changing the film to suit the environments, to suit the cinematic language. A stunning achievement. Um, and yeah, what a film, what a film. <laughs> just, oh. <laughs> just, it's one of those, if you're an animal lover, you should watch it, but... So hard. Uh, right, let's jump in to the next one. I don't care what number we're at. Uh, Radiance had a hell of a year, didn't they? Um, their first year in business. Man on the Roof um, is my favourite release from them, amongst many, but Man on the Roof by Bo Witherberg. There was a lot of talk um, when this was reviewed um, in, in uh, some outlets. Not the good outlets, like my good buddy Sam, film blogger Sam, like, share, subscribe on his channel, um, who reviewed this. Um, but it was a talk on some lazier outlets, not Sam, that this kind of sets up the Scandi Noir, you know, um, uh, Dragon Tattoo films, uh, Valander, all those kind of things, uh, The Crossing, whatever it's called, The Killing, even. Actually, coming out in 1976, this feels like if Sidney Lumet was on holiday in Sweden and thought, I'll make a make a film while I'm here and pay for the holiday. This is the film he would have made. Because it actually fits in perfectly to that Friedkin, Lumet, um, 70s period of filmmaking about crime and about police and about public safety and and uh, it's essentially yes yeah, it's, it's the man on the roof so you can imagine you can see the cover there so you probably know there's going to be a sniper involved but it's so well paced like a lot of those films from the 70s by guys like Sidney Lumet like a Serpico say it takes its time in establishing the cops so a crime's committed at the start we take time to establish the 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 whys and wherefores, our main investigator, a little supporting cast, and then we put them into further danger after the revelations come out as to who's done it and why. 
Um, but the action set pieces towards the end are as good as anything you would have seen in a Dirty Harry film in that period. I promise you that. There's a scene with a helicopter that I'm thinking, they're not going to show you that. Oh, wow. Wow, it did. Um, yeah, stunning, stunning stuff. Action cinema from Sweden, but brilliant character work from Sweden from 1976. And Viderberg's films were a lot more esoteric and weren't always, certainly weren't always this um, action packed. He would make one film that was a bit like this, The Man from Mallorca, um, about a decade later, which isn't as good. I've seen that, but uh, yeah, this is this is just great, great stuff from Radiance. Absolutely stacked with special features as well, with two documentaries in the film and on Viderberg's career in general. Um, yeah, all sorts. What a great debut for Radiance. Uh, great debut year, but what a wonderful, wonderful film. Um. Another twofer, when things match thematically, I'm just tossing them in together because it lets me do more than I should have, really. Um, a filmmaker that I fell in love with in the 1990s, when film four started, um, was Jean-Pierre Genet. And we've now got 4Ks of Delicatessen and The City of Lost Children, his first two features. Um, he went on to, of course, direct um, Amelie, and very long affair, and the the film after this, Alien Resurrection, and if you if you've seen Alien Resurrection and you haven't seen these, and you've always wondered what was that? It's kind of offbeat, strange aesthetic, and all the oddities and all the green. It's this. It is Jean Pierre Genet's aesthetic. Um, he is in a lineage of Terry Gilliam. There's definitely a lot of Terry Gilliam inspiring him. But he also kind of sets up uh, Guillermo del Toro. There's certainly del Toro uh, influences uh, on del Toro from Genet. And in a strange way, Wes Anderson. There are parts of the set design specifically on City of Lost Children which are intentionally as uh, artificial and even if he had more money, they're intentionally as artificial. He wants them to stand out as being products of filmmaking rather than looking real, as anything in Wes Anderson's catalogue where we can tell it's miniatures and he wants you to know that he wants to set up his own cinematic little universe. Um, and Junet makes these same decisions. Um, these are wonderful, dark fairy tales. I think this is my favourite of the two uh, with Ron Perlman, so... The plots, I don't know where you'd even start. Um, essentially, there's a boarding house um, above a delicatessen, which is actually killing some residents and uh, selling them as meat. But it's not as Sweeney Toddish as that sounds at all. It's 100% different from that. And this, um, it's about a city of lost children, but there's an oil rig in the sea where... Uh, bunch of clones live and one of them's a brain in a jar and Ron Perlman's a strong man who befriends a little girl and they go on an adventure and there's sinister Siamese twins trying to trying to destroy them. And this all sounds like kiddie fair, but no, it's a 15 and parts of it could easily be an 18. It's dark adult fairy tale stuff. Um, with remarkable filmmaking on low budgets from from Junie. There's a reason why he got the alien job, and it's these two films, um, stunning achievements of world cinema in the 90s, so full of imagination, so wondrous that it's kind of sad that he's not made anything even remotely as good since these two, to be honest. Because I wasn't a massive fan of, of uh, Fred Long Affair or Amelie in his last few French films. Uh, next up, I'm going to go with uh, Joseph Lossy. Um, he's had a lot of critical reappraisal in the past few decades, really. Um, although uh, Burn has never had... Well, anyway. But um, is that the name of it? With Taylor and Burn? The one in an island? Um, but my favourite Joseph Lossy film isn't... Um, 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 the um, the servant with uh, Dirk Bogard. It is a Dirk Bogard film, but it's King and Country. Um, it's a film which I caught on BBC Two, I think, years ago. And when uh, when uh, it was announced that 
it was coming out from Studio Canal Classics. I was very excited. This isn't the most stacked edition. There's only a, a, a Tom Courtney interview and an archive interview with Dirk Bogart. But it's not about that. Um, it's about the film itself. And essentially, if you like, the shorthand version is it's a British version of Paths of Glory. But it's made by an American in Joseph Lozzi. Um, was he originally a European who moved to America? Don't quote me on that, but I think he's just American. Ju he's just American. Can't help it. Um, but it, his outsider's eye, like in The Servant, was able to comment and notice things about the societal class of the UK that someone inside it would take for granted. So he was able to spot the hypocrisies, the lunacies, um, the irreverent nature in some places, and and how that can lead to some incredibly dark places in others. So it's a World War One film where a soldier is on court martial for desertion, and Dirk Bogard, played by Tom Courtney, and I think his film debut certainly his breakout role. Um, but Dirk Bogard is his defendant, um, and he's a gentleman officer who looks down on Tom Courtney as being he's just a cobbler. But again, it's really a takedown of the society that, that's pushed them into this meaningless war. And and what a War One certainly was, wasn't it? Um, just fought for absolutely no reason. It's not as if you had Hitler to, you know, the, the rise of fascism looming. Um, no, World War One was a family dispute. And, and Lossie makes that clear, where he has a great shot of... He, he he juxtaposes conversations with stills from real life. And at one point, they reference king and country. And when it cuts to king and country, you see the uh, the king with his cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm, Wilhelm. So it was a family dispute. And Lossie's commenting on that by saying, so the guy you're fighting is the king's fucking cousin. And here they are all chummy chummy. It's a family dispute and you guys are all sitting here in the trenches over it. It's absolute nonsense um, and people are dying for it and killing your own for it potentially in, in, in this court martial's instance. Um, a stunning achievement, some some things in it, some images of uh, graves and um, decomposing bodies that will stay with you for a long time, but it's never gratuitous. Um, soldiers talking about a trapped rat and Tom Courtney's character is after the same thing because they've become so desensitized to death at this point. Yeah, it's it's wonderful stuff from Joseph Lossie. So just because this isn't a big stacked 4K edition, please don't overlook it because it's one of my one of my favorites of the year, as you can tell from having it this high. The BFI uh, release of Ken Russell's Gothic in at number four. Stunning, stunning stuff. Essentially, this is uh, probably the fifth or sixth different cinematic take on that fateful night at um, uh, Villa uh, Gidati, the the estate of Lord Lord Byron in Switzerland, um, and the the summer that uh, that Percy and Mary, Mary Shelley came and. They had the competition famously to to do some stories together and Mary Shelley came up with the impetus for Frankenstein, which went on to become quite a popular thing, as you know. But that's not the story of this, really. Essentially, it imagines in a very Ken Russell style what happens if we go there and we explore the psyches of these four people, of Shelley, of Mary, uh, Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, of the Doctor, um, the what was his name, John, played by Timothy Spall, um, the guy that went on to to write Le Vampire, uh, the first vampire novel in eighteen sixteen or so, um, and um, of course Byron himself, played by Gabriel Byrne. What if we go to this estate and we imagine the monsters inside of them that perhaps led them to to create? monsters through their through their, their works and it really does that in a very ken russell over the top style um with a, an insane soundtrack from thomas dolby you have um she blinded me with science fame it, it pushes you into the realm of 
this should just be a normal little film about what inspired Frankenstein, but actually it's showing you some really sinister stuff, some really dark stuff. It's conjuring monsters. It's presenting all involved as being wicked and depraved, and their own depravities are shown by their promiscuity, which leads the more promiscuous they are, the more damned their souls seem to be. And there's a wonderful little capper at the end, uh, which I won't even slightly hint at, but it's great stuff. Um, yeah, just see this for a really esoteric look at how to do a gothic tale, um, because it's stunning stuff. Um, one of the later achievements of Ken Russell. And what an addition from the BFI. You even get uh, The Fall of the Louse of Usher, um, his 2002 film you get that in its entirety on the bonus features amongst many many others so what this is just stunning stunning stuff any fan of gothic cinema of more offbeat horror in general i think you'd really appreciate this it's uh yeah it's filthy it's deprived it's wicked it's wonderful and at number three we'll go with a film that's not from a big studio it's not from a big Blu-ray house. It's just a great bloody film that came out this year. Lola. Um, this is... So, uh, it's incredibly low budget. Um, it's shot on film stock um, that's supposed to look like the 1930s and 40s. And essentially it concerns these two sisters. It's found footage, but and believe me, when I saw that it was found footage, I, I thought, oh, We've done this, found footage, and here's another term that I thought, we've done this, alternate World War II. Great, right? How many times do we need to do these two tropes? Actually, it finds a way to do both full of originality. So these two sisters have, off screen before we even started, invented a machine that they name after their mother called Lola. And Lola enables them to see uh, radio waves from the future, so why can we only see things, if radio waves can exist from the past and travel across the universe, why can't they come back from the future as well? So when they turn Lola on, and this isn't a spoiler, it happens in the first few minutes of the film, in 1913, no, I think 1941 actually, they, it must be about then because we're in the middle of the Blitz, they turn Lola on and the first thing they see in the 1940s is David Bowie singing in Space Oddity. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're in for here. And I love it. They're picking up these waves from the future. And again, I'm not doing anything beyond the first, say, 20 minutes of the film. They decide to use this foreknowledge to, to help in the war effort. And mm, mm, you can probably take a few ideas of where that's going to go from there. Every change they make has consequences. And in changing the future so much, next time they turn on the television, David Bowie doesn't exist anymore. Because maybe maybe David Bowie's parents met because they were at a bomb shelter at the same time, and now there wasn't an, wasn't an air raid that night, and they never met. Um, the butterfly effect, the bootstrap paradox, throw them all in, and this film takes them to their logical extension without bogging you down with scientific theory it just presents the consequences so all in black and white incredibly low budget all on film grain and all found footage presented as a film that's been sent back by someone to to present this as some kind of message it's a stunning achievement it's one of the best things i've seen in years in terms of genre film um, it's directed by Andrew Legg, um, and he gives a great commentary along with Alan Marr on the on the disc as well. It's the only extra, but I'm not docking any points whatsoever for a lack of extras because the film itself is such a stunning achievement that I think I gave it a round of applause even though I watched it myself. Lola, stunning, stunning, stunning stuff. Tops two. Number two, again, we're going back to Studio Canal. What a bloody year they've had. Studio Canal's release of The Queen of Spades, Thorold Dickinson's The Queen of Spades. Um, what an interesting 
far too short career he had. Um, I just watched one of his the other week, um, the Arsenal Stadium mystery, um, and he'd rented Gaslight from 1940. And what a, what a poor legacy the guys had, because Gaslight... MGM remade it in 1944 and tried to find all the original copies of the his version, the UK version, and have them destroyed lest people think it was better than their remake. Thankfully, that never happened. We've got it in a lovely edition from the BFI. Uh, Thorough Dickinson kept copies of all his films, thank goodness. And this too was lost for years. It was only rediscovered in 2009, so it's only been back for just over a decade remarkable um essentially um it's it's uh anton walbrook's character anton walbrook the one of the greats uh, of of films of Pelham pressburger such as the red shoes um but anton walbrook's character hears tell that there's um this book which has the secret to um everlasting life um it, Money, fame, essentially all the secrets that you'd you'd want. You can probably see where that's going. Um, be careful what you wish for, kind of stuff. And he finds that um, he has to contact um, this countess, played by the the wonderful um, Dame Edith Evans, who people might know from all of the uh, Alistair Sim Scrooge or um, importance of being earnest, maybe. Um, the Asquith version, but he has to contact her because it turns out she made the same deal. She read the same book back in the day. Um, this is a wonderful film. I don't want to go too much further than that into the plot. A wonderful, magical film um, about, again, be careful what you wish for, about consequences, about not thinking through what you're wishing for. Um, I, I, and it's just full of, of whimsy and wonder but in the darkest possible way uh, Thorold had this this great way about him of being able to depict the darkest possible way of doing things but not uh, not go too far with it where it seems that he's uh, nihilistic I mean it's based on um, Pitchkin's novel it's set in Russia in the early 19th century but Believe it's in English. Um, believe me, you will absolutely love this if you've not seen it. It's stacked with special features, um, with with all sorts about Thorold Nicholson, um, Nicholson, and um, Nick, Nick Pinkinson's commentary has been carried over. There's an introduction from Martin Scorsese, who calls it one of the few true classics of supernatural cinema. The supernatural element is very much implied and therefore inferred in a lot of places but there are explicit scenes of it towards the climax of the film. Um, but yeah, it's it's great. And the performance is all around world class. It's Thorold Nicholson's um, masterpiece and highly, highly recommended. So yeah, Queen of Spades. Film of the year, a Blu-ray of the year, both in this case. Wonderfully, for the first time of doing these on YouTube, my film, my Blu-ray of the year is also a film of the year. Um, which is rather exciting um, because sometimes my film of the year hasn't been released on Blu-ray yet or the edition's lacking, blah, blah, blah. No, in both cases, everything here is what you need. Ennius Main um, from the BFI, tried to be Mark Jenkins, his second full feature. This is so... Um, so it's... <sighs> Folk horror is what it's been labelled as. It's certainly a folk tale, and there's horrific elements, but it lets a lot of the horror, if you will, come from your imagination. Um, it was filmed during lockdown, but again, Billy, one of the previous films uh, that I mentioned, the Jean-Pierre Jeunet double, even if there was more money available, I get the impression that this film wouldn't have been any different, even if it wasn't lockdown uh, restriction uh, on set, that kind of thing. I get the impression it would have happened this way anyway. It's the story of a woman who has a job of checking the fauna on this cliff top and documenting it every day, this isolated cliff top down in uh, Cornwall. And she has to check the, the state of it every day and go back and fill in a diary. 
And essentially, it's the repetitive nature of that, about her just checking the fauna, making tea, firing up the, the motor to power the small home that she has there. And this too is presented um, in old grain film stock style. Um, but like um, Lola, but this is much more authentic. Um, and it feels like, it feels like Nigel Neal has written a folk horror that has been produced for Play of Today in 1973 or something like that. It's got that, that vibe to it. It could be on short, sharp shocks from the BFI or the Play of Today sets because um, it's it's remarkable how much how much this film makes you feel, um, how much this film haunts you, the imagery in it. And it's about a woman who's just checking in some, some flowers and documenting the change, but it's so much more than that. It's about the isolation. It's about the past and how history haunts us. It leaves a lot open to interpretation, but it also gives you enough to work on. So it's not being obtuse. It's not being film wanky about it. It's giving you enough breadcrumbs that you can follow everything along. And even if your head doesn't know what you're watching at some point, your heart does. Or more importantly, in some places, your stomach does, because your stomach will be churning at some points, making these connections as you go along through the film. When things start to become more esoteric isn't even the words, when things start to become more uncanny, um, when things start to become more surreal is an overused word, but I, th I think it certainly applies here. There's a little bit of um, field in England in here as well. There's there's a little bit of um, a film that's included on here as well as an extra. Um, what's the name of it again? Uh, Haunters of the Deep, um, the Children's Foundation film. And to go on to it, this, this is that. So for a new film, this has got all the kind of extras that, that you'd get on a, a classic film from the BFI. It's almost like they recognise that this is going to be such an insta-classic for genre fans because it's got the commentary from Mark Jenkin with Mark Kermode. It's got um, the BFI conversations. It's got um, a, an interview with Peter Strickland, the great director of Barbarian Sound Studio, talking, talking with... Uh, Mark Jenkins, it's got that uh, aforementioned film from the, the studio, the, the Children's Film, uh, film Foundation. Um, Mark Jenkins talking about the, uh, the the score of the film, which is quite remarkable and haunting in its own way, um, as is the actual sound, irrespective of the score, just the sounds, some of the noises that will haunt you. So, yeah, this, this film is just stunning stuff, and you can't really spoil it. It's not that kind of film. It's not, and then the ghost at the end. It's not that kind of film at all. It's just something to experience. So, if any of these kind of things I've referenced, even a more advanced Mr. James, anything like that tickles your fancy. Um, Nigel Neal's work certainly, but folk horror, but which leaves you to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, I think Jacques Tourneur would have loved this with his, with his. Uh, approach to filmmaking where don't show things, leave it up to the viewer's imagination. There's a lot of that going on here. There's an absolute ton of that going on here. And even some of the restrictions, again, I think they would they work perfectly if, if there were restrictions. People being isolated, um, people being shot from distances that are... I can almost relive this film in my head a year after I first saw it and a couple of rewatches since. I can almost see it beat for beat and shot for shot. I can remember her in the red jacket walking past the monument, dropping the stone down the well, her little routine that she has. I can remember the church with the pastor that may or may not have been her pastor, may, may be her imaginations of what the land has done. And because it's a folk horror, it's very much the land itself that's bringing up this presence. Um, and yeah, that although it looks more orange on the cover, that bright red um, jacket, I don't think is a coincidence because it's 
it's also got a touch of Nicholas Rogue about it in terms of some of the editing and some of the connections that the the filmmaker wants you to make. And of course, Nicholas Rogue, Red Jacket. I'm not gonna need to say too much more than that. I think Donald Sutherland running around in Venice. Um, so yeah, this is stunning film of the year and Blu-ray of the year. So there you go. So come back next time because we're gonna be looking at box sets of the year for Blu-rays. And there's a ton of those too, but hopefully there'll be a few things for you that've tickled your fancy there. Oh, expensive year, eh? Oh well, folks, thanks very much, and I'll see you in a few days' time for Box Sets of the Year and then Albums of the Year. Catch you.